to some of you who have only recently joined my audience, this is the third time I have made a video on Flashpoint as a comic and its adaptations. I made my first video on Flashpoint back in 2020 when I was just starting out, and the second video on it back in 2021, after I had gotten the DaVinci Resolve as my current video editing software. Both of those videos were so made before the 2023 Flash movie had come out, and now that it has come out, failing to do the one job it was supposed to do, the time has come for me to cover Flashpoint again, with the format I have built for myself in reviewing comic book stories and their adaptations. Okay, so... Flashpoint is a 2011 comic book crossover consisting five main issues written by Jeff Johns and drawn by Andy Kubert. There are some tie-in title series made for it too, but they do not matter in this context, except as a way of fleshing out this crapsack world that Flash ends up finding himself in. By now, aka over a decade later, the storyline has become infamous for having caused a company-wide reboot leading to the New 52, which according to some sources I have heard from, was apparently a last-minute idea made by DC's then-acting co-publisher Dandy Dio. This is an outrage, a travesty, a plucky puck! Meaning that if it wasn't for his involvement, Flashpoint would have ended without rebooting anything and would be remembered less infamously as a story where Barry Allen's Flash woke up in a strange, different timeline and tried to return to his own original one. Look at you. You were once so proud. Go now and never return. Before I start commenting on the comic story, I need to address a certain aspect of it and why those two previous videos I had made were named the missing half of Flashpoint. See, the thing about the comic itself is that it opens with Barry Allen waking up in the Flashpoint timeline without any setups, and he then references to past events implying that there was a setup to the story. And there was. First, there is Crisis on Infinite Earths in 1985, where Barry died fighting the Anti-Monitor and Psycho Pirate by running so fast that his body disintegrated from existence. Then there is Final Crisis in 2008, where Barry Allen returned from the Speed Force after Wally West had been the Flash in his place for the 23 years after his death. And then there is the other main story I showcased in my original videos, aka the 2009 Flash Rebirth miniseries written by Jeff Johns and drawn by Ethan Van Skyver. Flash Rebirth 2009 was the beginning of the Road to Flashpoint, as it explored Barry Allen's return to life after 23 years with his friends, family and enemies reacting to his return. Jay Garrick, the Golden Age Flash in the Justice Society, reminiscent nostalgically how they had first met, and their friendship was framed similar to a reader who would reminisce of the time when they had first read the Silver Age comic starring Barry Allen. Wally West, Barry's replacement after his death during the crisis and a member of the Justice League and the Titans, fondly remembered how he had gained his powers, become the Kid Flash, and having become a superhero thanks to having known Barry. Pretty much like a reader who had been brought into the comics and been a fan thanks to the hero. And then there was Bart Allen, the current Kid Flash, member of the Teen Titans, and Barry's grandson from the future, don't ask, just look it up, who represented that demographic who had grown up with Wally West as their Flash, and was so not as open-minded about Barry's return. Who's in charge here? I guess I am. And then there was Iris West Allen, Barry's wife back when she was still portrayed as a redhead, who was shown as the loved one just happy that her husband had returned to her. But Barry Allen himself was shown feeling rather melancholy about his return. As a man brought into the future from a past, or as someone who had been at peace in death before being ripped back to life. This melancholy then developed into doubtful angst once Barry and Wally came across the corpse of the Black Flash, the supposed Grim Reaper of the Speed Force, where all of these speedsters get their powers. 
and this angst then went from bad to worse with the arrival of Savitar, who dies immediately upon making physical contact with Barry, and then with the death of Savitar's follower, Christina Alexandrova, who suffers the same fate when attempting to avenge her messiah. The deaths of these two speedster villains caused Barry to become infected with an unknown dark speed force energies that then turned him into the next Black Flash. The Justice League tried to help Barry in containing him, but stuck with the angst, Barry decided to run fast enough to leave the physical world and go back to the speed force as a self-sacrifice. In the speed force, Barry came across one of his oldest enemies, Eobard Thorne, who is also known as Professor Zoom the Reverse Flash, a supervillain from the future, and whom I will be referring to by all three of those names in this video by the way. Thorne noted being disappointed on how Barry had arrived too early, as turning him into the Black Flash had been the villain's evil plan in which Professor Zoom had recreated the events that had turned Barry into the Flash with different circumstances and chemical ingredients, in order to create this separate, negative speed force to infect the speed force that Barry had been connected to when becoming the Flash. And this was one of Jeff Johns' retcons, by the way, because the concept of the speed force was created during Wally's tenure as the Flash by Mark Wade. As the Patient Zero connected to the speed force, Barry was supposed to kill his friends, family and loved ones as the Black Flash, and then be running into the Speed Force out of guilt. But being the hero that he is, he sacrificed himself by isolating himself to the Speed Force to protect them, much earlier than the Reverse Flash had estimated him to. Thorne still took Barry's exile to the corrupted Speed Force as a consolation prize in knowing that he would be trapped there, while the villain would leave to kill the hero's loved ones. Barry, however, managed to escape from the corrupted speed force with the help of Wally West, whose arrival to save him also began to purify the speed force, with them now knowing about Professor Zoom's actions, while Jay Garrick and Bart Allen intercepted the reverse Flash trying to kill Wally's family. With the four generations of the Flash and other speedsters being charged by the purified speed force, Thor was ultimately defeated, but there was a twist. Turning Barry into the Black Flash, the plan that got thwarted, was only the second part of Professor Zoom's plan, while the first part had been completed successfully long before the story had even begun. By being a speedster villain from the future, the Reverse Flash was no stranger to time travel, and he had been retroactively using the negative speed force to go back through Barry's life and causing everything bad that had ever happened to him. All without the butterfly effect kind of consequences. Examples of this include pushing an elementary school-aged Barry down the stairs and break his arm, leaving his house's front door open, which led to the family dog getting run over by a car, Barry's childhood home burning down due to faulty wiring, and worst of all, which has been remembered most strongly thanks to the CW's Flash TV show, murdering Barry's mother Nora and framing his father Henry for it. These retroactive changes to Barry's life had been the source of his melancholy at the beginning of the story, as symptoms of the changes in Barry's timeline being altered. Before the Flash Rebirth 2009 limited series, Barry Allen was raised into adulthood by his living parents, and they had lived to an old age while Barry had been the Flash up until Crisis on Infinite Earths. But all of that was changed by Thorn changing the events in Barry's life in his twisted revenge on Reverse. This, along with a 12-issue series showing how Barry dealt with the knowledge learned in Flash Rebirth 2009, was the setup for the better-known follow-up story, written by Jeff Johns and drawn by Andy Kubert, that was released two years later in 2011, Flashpoint, which then led to DC's second company-wide reboot of New 52, and inspired Warner Bros. executives in 2018 to try and ultimately fail to reboot the DCEU. Okay, that is the most 
of the setup needed to lead up to the main event, which took me 8 to 10 word pages to write down by the way. And that should be all the information you need to understand why Flashpoint is not one story on its own. It's the latter half of a larger story, so adapting it on its own would be like starting to watch a movie trilogy from the last installment, or a TV show from its last season before it's getting cancelled. What's the worst that could happen? See? No consequences! As this will also be a long video, here are the time codes to each section for those of you who can't watch this video on the first go. And because I had to put so much work into this video, remember to like, comment and share this video so YouTube's algorithm will also acknowledge its existence. And now let's talk about the Flashpoint comic. Okay, the first issue of Flashpoint opened with a narration over a brief description of the DC Universe from the Flash's point of view, but being told by a third person. In it we see a young Barry with his mother Nora with their car busted in the rain next to a highway, without anyone stopping to help them, before the recap goes over Barry's origin story in becoming the Flash, how he married Iris, and show these other speedsters that Dandy Dio decided don't matter when he told Jeff Johns to make Flash Flashpoint a reboot story. Justice League also gets a two-page spread cameo before Barry is shown waking up in a world that is not what the previous narration described. Not having his powers, or being connected to the Speed Force anymore, and seeing his mother alive is what makes him realize that something has changed. The warm reunion between the mother and son is short and sweet, but after being told that his father died to a heart attack three years ago, Barry decides to confidently tell his mother about being a superhero called the Flash, who has lost his powers and something has changed in the past. Naturally, his mother reacts with confusion when Barry asks her about Superman and the Justice League's presence, but knows what he is talking about when Barry brings up Batman. We then move into the introduction of this world's red-eyed Batman, hunting down a female accomplice of his Joker, whom he exposits to have kidnapped Judge Harvey Dent's twins, before then throwing her off the building for not giving any intel to him. She is however rescued by Cyborg, who leaves her for the police to pick up before approaching the red-eyed Batman to recruit him into a holographic meeting with other heroes and villains. The issue then transitions to Barry trying to go meet his wife Iris at her work place, only to learn that she is married, or at the very least involved with another man and doesn't recognize Barry in her peripheral vision. As Barry is processing this sight, his mother outside is neatly greeted by Professor Zoom, before Barry comes out telling her that they needed to cancel whatever plans they originally had, and asks if he can borrow her car. Back to Cyborg and the Red-Eyed Batman, we get a lore exposition on this world, where Aquaman and Wonder Woman are waging a war that has drowned most of Europe, and caused a gender genocide on Great Britain. Before their war has the potential of destroying the world as collateral damage, Cyborg is imploring everyone to join him to intervene with their war and save the world from being destroyed. Initially most of them are open to join, in six pages of negotiation which establishes some characters who will be important later, like Captain Thunder, Element Woman and Enchantress, but when the Red-Eyed Batman refuses to join as their strategist, everyone else ends up backing out from being a part of Cyborg's team. The first issue of Flashpoint ends with Barry having driven from Central City to Gotham, through rain and traffic jams, until he reaches a ramshacked Wayne Manor and makes his way to the Batcave. Also, what the hell were Jeff Johns and Andy Kubert thinking when they decided to have these stairs drawn like this? This is not artful or stylish, it's a workplace accident waiting to happen. Down in the nearly barren Batcave, at least when compared to the mainstream one, Barry is naturally attacked by the red-eyed Batman in seeing him as an intruder in his home. But when Barry calls him Bruce, the red-eyed Batman tells Barry he watched him die, revealing in this late-to-the-party spoiler that this red-eyed Batman is Thomas Wayne. 
The second issue opens with its first six pages showing how pirate Deathstroke has accidentally sailed too deep into the drowned Europe in the fog, for which Aquaman shows up and kills him along with his crew. Have fun reading that tie-in series knowing it has a foregone conclusion in it. No time to read a list. Approved. Next. Back to Barry and the Red-Eyed Batman, whom I'm going to call Thomas from here on. Fighting in the Batcave because Thomas still sees Barry as an intruder in his home, and Barry tries in vain to reach out to him in asking for his help. Then Barry gets a seizure as this new timeline begins to start rewriting his memories, and then he drops his flash ring which Thomas allows Barry to open as an attempt to prove his story on why he is there. As Barry was clearly not carrying the ring on himself, the ring instead spits out a yellow reverse flash costume. But that then gives Barry something concrete to focus on in trying to convince Thomas that they are in an alternate timeline. Barry so tells Thomas who Eobard Thorne is, and how he changed the past without consequences to kill Barry's mother and friend his father for it when he was a child, without Barry learning about it until he had grown up to be the Flash, and how his mother is somehow alive now. Thomas then decides to ask Barry why he called him Bruce when he attacked him, and hearing from Barry that Bruce was supposed to survive to become Batman instead of him, Thomas is so motivated to help Barry change things back to the way they are supposed to be, starting with getting Barry his speed back. In transitioning to the next scene where they try to do that, we get a cutaway scene to the Great Britain, where Steve Trevor is chased by Amazons before being caught by Wonder Woman with her lasso, which then makes Steve to say or imply that Wonder Woman and Lois Lane are on the same rank as the most beautiful women in the world. Steve's fate is left ambiguous as we get back to Gotham, where Barry and Thomas have built an electric chair with a lightning rod to the roof of Wayne Manor. Barry sits down to the electric chair in explaining how he got his powers, but the second issue then ends with him just getting set on fire and getting third degree burns. Before I get to the third issue, I'll also point out that one of those tie-in series Flashpoint got was a Brian Asarello written and Eduardo Rizzo drawn mini called Flashpoint Batman Night of Vengeance, which is implied by its third and final issue to take place between the second and third issues of the main series, while Barry is effectively in a coma. That is the series where we get to see Martha Wayne as the female Joker of this world, and while confronting her, Thomas uses the knowledge he got from Barry to pacify her by telling Martha that he has been given the chance to change the world to be so that they died in Crime Alley, and Bruce survived instead. Okay, moving to issue 3 next. Cyborg is told by cameoing President Obama that he did his best, but having ultimately failed at recruiting a team to oppose Aquaman and Wonder Woman, now is the US military stirred while Cyborg gets honorably discharged. Back to Batcave, where Barry is waking up from his coma and tries to get back at it with Thomas telling him not to. But then Barry gets an another seizure when his memories are being rewritten again. Thomas so ultimately agrees to help Barry try again to keep him from forgetting the version of Bruce he knows. Quick action set piece told in the next four pages, this time they succeed in giving Barry his speed back in a spectacular action sequence where Thomas almost dies, and Barry saves him from being impaled by the sharp fence. Then we get to see Lois Lane as a foreign correspondent behind enemy lines in Britain, and making contact with the local resistant just as a scene transitioning. There's a lot of people waiting. You'll have to take a number. And back to the Batcave, reconnecting back to the Speed Force makes Barry's third degree burns heal quickly, and with different materials that Thomas is not using around the manor, Barry also manages to build himself a new costume as he refuses to wear Thorn's yellow suit. Next, they start to look up where the Justice League members Barry used to know are in this timeline, while Barry also explains to Thomas how his and Professor Zoom's powers can be used for time travel. Long story short, Barry can't change things back if he doesn't know what the thing that changed everything in the first place was. 
And TLDR or that other thing, Aquaman and Wonder Woman situations are obvious. Hal Jordan never got his Green Lantern ring and neither did any other human after him. And Baby Call L ship crash landed into Metropolis killing multiple people in the process, which led him to be imprisoned by the US government. Superman is still the best chance Barry recognized as an ally they would need against the Reverse Flash. So Thomas contacts Cyborg under the guise of agreeing to become his team strategist under the condition that Cyborg lets him and Barry know where Superman is being held at. While hesitant and suspicious at Thomas's request, Cyborg complies and hacks into all of government's databases until he finds references to Project Superman and agrees to take Thomas and Barry to Subject 1 under Metropolis, where they then find a very emaciated and timid Kal El, whom they are forced to break out of his cell because the alarm goes off. They then flee from the armed guards to the outside, where the third issue ends with Kal El flying away the first time he sees the sun, and leaving Barry, Thomas and Cyborg behind to deal with the guards who were given shoot to kill orders. The fourth issue then opens with two framing devices that also work as Chekhov guns for later. With Billy Batson and his foster siblings watching President Obama's speech on television at their home in Fort City, and Hal Jordan, who never became a Green Lantern, being sent to what will eventually be a suicide mission. Then we get to Barry, Thomas and Cyborg trying to survive the armed forces of Project Superman, until they are eventually rescued by Element Woman. A character who was previously shown in issue 1's holographic meeting, disappointed that they couldn't team up before and has been stalking Cyborg since then, and is now happy to join them if she is allowed to join them. Thomas is not happy about letting Element Woman join them because he doesn't seem to like her anime girl-like personality, but then Barry gets another Caesar as his memories are again being rewritten, and Barry saying that he won't soon be able to remember what his original timeline was like. So Thomas decides to put his biases against Element Woman aside, and gives Barry an epileptic shot of phenytoin sodium, before they then decide to take Barry to the Batson residence in Fawcett City. Thomas justifies this action by referencing to a noodle incident he has apparently heard about, where Billy and the other Sam kids supposedly helped Wesley Dodge Sandman recover his memories, and should so be able to do the same for Barry. Billy gives it a go, and so ends up seeing flashes of his post-crisis life, from when Sam was still allowed to be called Captain Marvel without being confused with Brie Larson. Before he can ask Barry any questions about it, the TV that no one decided to turn off cuts to a news report about how Hal's suicide mission ended up exactly as I said it would. And Cyborg lets them know that Aquaman and Wonder Woman's war is now hitting that point where they all know there won't be a tomorrow. This causes Barry's heroic instincts to kick in and tell Thomas that they need to put their hunt for Eobar Thorn on hold until they have made sure Aquaman and Wonder Woman won't destroy the world. Barry could easily justify this as buying time for them until they have managed to find Professor Zoom and figure out what was changed so they can fix it, but instead he just makes Thomas put down this ultimatum. Either we change this world, or let it burn in hell! And because Thomas ended up shouting that, Cyborg and the Sasam kids come to join them to explain Barry why they need Thomas to be their strategist. Not just because he might be a good tactician, but because his legend and reputation being needed to inspire more people to join in. I don't know if this is supposed to be meta-commentary on Batman's real-world popularity, but this thing about writing Batman in story similarly as outside of the story is one of the many things why Batman's popularity is decaying, and why I myself no longer identify as a Batman fanboy anymore, and have separated myself back to just being a fan who knows the character's limits. More people should do the same so we can get better portrayals of Batman in the future, where he is not unintentionally made to look bad by being written by worshipping fanboys and fangirls, like how what happened with Justice League 2. You can check out that video after this one. Anyway, Barry tells Thomas that Bruce would have joined Cyborg's team as the needed strategist, and that makes Thomas join them. Excellent argument! Approved! 
All of them then fly to Great Britain on Thomas Wayne's private jet, because unlike Bruce, Thomas never had a bad plane, and in none of his appearances in this comic series, he is never even shown to have a Batmobile. Although I assume Cyborg may have used his technopathy to slightly upgrade and tune up the plane, so it can have this holographic table projector for the rest of the team to be called in. As they enter the former British airspace, now Themyscira's airspace, Enchantress teleports on board the plane to join them as a late setup for when she eventually betrays them. The Sazam kids unite into Captain Thunder, who goes after Wonder Woman, and Barry tries to reach out to Aquaman, while Cyborg tells Thomas that Aquaman has a bioweapon that can, quote, bring the island down, unquote, and Element Woman is so far just there. Then Enchantress betrays them as I said she would, by turning Captain Thunder back into the six Sam kids, which is followed by Wonder Woman killing Billy. So the kids can't turn into Captain Thunder anymore, and are now a burden that they need to protect from the war. This is where the fourth issue ends, with Barry being confronted by the Reverse Flash, who with a pleased look on his face blames Barry for everything that has happened. Okay, and the final fifth issue opens with Eobard Thorn talking down on Barry, while Cyborg and Element Woman try to protect the surviving Sasam kids, as Aquaman and Wonder Woman resume to what they were doing before they showed up. Barry then aggressively demands Professor Zoom to reveal what he did to the world, to which the Reverse Flash responds with this and another late to the party spoiler. He never did anything to change the past to turn the world into this. Barry did, as the result of Eobard Thorn changing Barry's past to make him so miserable that come his mother's next birthday, and Barry would be so distraught from knowing what Professor Zoom had done that he decided to go back in time and prevent Reverse Flash from doing those things, starting with his mother's death. I wrote that previous sentence into my script in cursive, by the way, because I wanted to make it absolutely clear that while Barry is responsible for changing the past, he only he did that because Thorn changed it first, and Barry was only trying to change it back to the way it was in the first place. However, without the negative speed force giving Barry the same immunity that Professor Zoom had when he killed Barry's mother, the timeline that is known as Flashpoint was created by the positive speed force reacting to the changes Barry tried to make. You can say that Barry was the one who did those changes, but you also need to acknowledge that he would not have had a reason or motivation to go forward with it if the Reverse Flash had not emotionally manipulated him into doing any of it first. Also, for no other reason than to expose it to us in this scene, Barry forgot ever doing it and Thorn is made to tell it to us through Barry, while also accusing Barry of the state of the world now, as if he didn't egg Barry into it. Thomas hears everything and tells Barry that now that they know that Barry did all this, he can still fix all of it if they can remove the reverse flash from the equation, which then causes Thor to beat Thomas up before explaining why he manipulated Barry into all of this. Because he is from the future, Professor Zoom always needed Barry to live a long, not necessarily happy life running, and generating the speed force, so it can exist by the time the Reverse Flash would first get his powers. By killing Barry, Eobard Thorn would have removed himself from history, so he did the next best thing by going after his loved ones, until Barry broke down and caused Flashpoint to happen. And now that the timeline has changed, Professor Zoom is free from being bound by the laws of time and ready to kill Barry, but luckily because he is a supervillain, the Reverse Flash has monologued long enough for Thomas to save Barry by killing Thorn. Any chance I can get in on that universal healthcare? Thomas, having heard everything Professor Zoom said, gives Barry a letter for Bruce and sends him to run away from this war as the rest of Cyborg's team finally arrives to participate in the war, Superman arrives to kill Enchantress and start to fight Aquaman and Wonder Woman, Gorilla Grodd and his Gorilla Army joins as the fourth party, and Aquaman's bioweapon goes off in beginning to level down Britain. 
Barry so begins to try running back in time to fix everything by stopping his past self from saving his mother. Before he however manages to catch up with his past self, Barry ends up on his mother's doorstep to have one final goodbye with her, while also explaining why everything that is happening is happening. Nora Allen tells her son that too many people have died so she can live, and with the time they have had together, she couldn't be prouder or happier to have a son like Barry. Promising she will be okay, Nora asks Barry to let her go, no matter how much they don't want to, and resumes stopping his past self for the good of the world as the hero he is supposed to be. Catching up and stopping his past self from saving his mother, Barry causes a ripple effect that leads to the creation of the New 52 continuity by merging the post-crisis continuity with DC's Wildstorm and Vertigo imprints. As this character, whom I was able to use better as a legacy character in my old fanfiction series, observes it happening. The checkbook's out of the library. Barry wakes up in this new timeline, but as his memories begun to change while in the Flashpoint timeline, he cannot be 100% sure if it is the same timeline he was from before, and thinks it's normal for his Flash custom to have extra lines. And Barry also mentions that he still possesses memories from both timelines, with and without his parents being present in his upbringing. No consequences! The story ends with Barry delivering the letter from Thomas Wayne's Batman, which is not shown properly but enough to imply it was the opening narration from issue 1 to Bruce Wayne of this timeline, who tearfully thanks Barry for being one hell of a messenger. Thank you. Okay, what is there for me to say about Flashpoint that has not already been said by other people? On its own, if you separate it from the New 52 reboot, it could be seen as a fine story on its own about loss, regret, trying to fix what you knew broken, and having to come accept that you can't always fix everything. More or less, it is what came after the series with the New 52, DC Rebirth, The Button, and Doomsday Clock, which have ultimately made it Flashpoint age somewhat poorly. Especially after it ended, the twist of Barry being responsible for the past being changed, and by extension for the new 52 happening, has by now become common knowledge. And then there were other writers who ignored Barry's final goodbye with his mother, as a way to keep him from moving on from her death, while also ignoring the fact that the reverse Flash had changed the past in the first place in justifying Barry's actions, and make people somewhat unfairly blame Barry, and only Barry, for causing Flashpoint to happen, without acknowledging Eobard Thorn's role in it. Get ready, Mr. And so essentially DC kept milking Barry's angst over Flashpoint when the New 52 made him be the only Flash to exist. Which is a shame as the 2009 Flash Rebirth series introduced these other characters who were put on a shelf along with Jay Garrick, Wally West and Bart Allen. Until the DC Reaver started to try fix that mess in 2016, with Dan Didio still present to throw clubs at the cards, by letting Brian Michael Bendis come over from Marvel to DC and mess up the plans Jeff Johns had led out by changing the Legion of Superheroes, along with Scott Snyder, whose Dark Knight's death metal ended up overwriting Doomsday Clock which was supposed to be the ending for that fix-up started by DC Rebirth. And then Dan Didio told Tom King to keep Alfred dead in his Batman run. There was no way for Doomsday Clock to remain as canon as it had Alfred alive in it. No time to read the list. Approved. Next. With that out of the way, let's talk about Andy Kubert's art next. The previous time I had to comment about it was in my Batman and Son Son of Batman video, which was published 5 years before Flashpoint, and again, 
I'm not sure if I should acknowledge the facial expressions and off-model looking proportions of some characters as a stylistic choice. The backgrounds, however, were that sort of quality that I must acknowledge being done with proper perspectives. q was also able to draw the right tones for certain moments where things got serious as well as heartwarming, such as when Barry first sees his mother alive again, when he has gotten his speed back, and then this part in the end when Professor Zoom thinks he has won. I will talk more about that scene later. Overall, these action scenes make me wish once again that this kind of style had been used for the animated adaptation, especially when it was for the most cases done as a spectacle over substantiated storytelling. And now we can probably move on to it. I keep Directed by Jay Oliva and written by James Krieg, Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox was released on July 30th in 2013 as a direct-to-video animated movie. I think the fact that Flashpoint got made into an animated movie two years after its original publication is why it ended up getting the attention it has today, and I also believe that most people in its audience are more familiar with that version of the story than they are with the comic, which is not a good thing. Like many other animated adaptations, this one made a couple of changes to the story for better and for worse reasons. And then there is the reminder that this movie was written by the same guy who made Commissioner Gordon be Jack the Ripper in the Gotham by Gaslight animated movie. One or two of the most egregious changes made into this movie is the absence of the Flash Reaver 2009 story elements, which justify Barry's actions for causing the Flashpoint timeline to happen in the first place, such as the fact that Barry's mother was murdered by the time-traveling Reverse Flash. Instead, Nora Allen is presented as a victim of a break-in, and Barry's father is not even mentioned in this movie. Eobard Thorne is included in the movie, but without having him be the real murderer, Professor Zoom is essentially reduced into just being a villain without a motivation. Which, by the way, could have been fixed early on with some dialogue changes in this scene set after the opening action set piece. After the Justice League has arrived to help the Flash stop Reverse Flash from using the rope to blow up the Flash Museum, change the dialogue to have something like this added to it. Boy, your petty little victories, Flash. But no matter how fast you run, you can't save everyone. How's your mother, Barry? You were the one, weren't you? I'm every bad day you ever had. That is how the movie could have established Eobard Thorne to have been Nora Allen's murderer, or at the very least hinted at it, so that Barry could have been made to question and wonder if Professor Zoom had killed his mother. Later in the movie, when confronted by the Reverse Flash again, Barry could have recalled that he went back in time to look if it was true, and seeing Eobard Thorne in the middle of the act then caused him to react emotionally. That would have been more in line with the comic's original story, and an adaptable retelling of it. Why couldn't you have done that?! Essentially, without having Professor Zoom be the murderer, his status as a villain without a motivation makes his presence in this movie surplus without a real purpose. Which kind of makes sense on why the 2023 Flash movie ended up cutting out the Reverse Flash entirely. And this also carries over to the ending scene where he appears again. 
without the Flash Rebirth 2009 story elements also fleshing out Elbar Thorne's character and motivations, the movie attempts to explain them away with this one scene. He hates you so much he'll destroy everything to kill you, but his psychosis requires that you know he's responsible. And based on that, Professor Zoom only ends up bragging at how all of this is so worth it in seeing Barry having caused the end of the world, like a generic supervillain or a schoolyard bully who ultimately didn't even do anything. You saved your mommy. The supreme act of selfishness shattered history like a rank amateur, turned the world into a living hell moments away from destruction. And I'm the villain? That last part only makes sense because he didn't do shit. Also, the Reverse Flash's monologue from the comic is much better with the way how Andy Kubert drew him, which makes not having C. Thomas Howell reading that speech instead a huge missed opportunity. I never killed you, Barry. Because I need you. I need Barry Allen to become the Flash and live a long life. Long enough to generate a speed force that would be accessible centuries after its creation. In the 25th century, in my time, I was running through the time stream when you altered it. Because of that, you've transformed me into a living paradox. You freed me from the shackles of any history. That means, no matter what happens to Barry Allen in the past, present or future, I will still exist. I am removed from the timeline. I exist outside of it. You don't matter to me. I can kill you in your mother's womb, or I can kill you this very second. I can hurt you, but you cannot hurt me, Barry. The legendary Flash cannot hurt Eobartan. What about me? Doctor's advice. When you're in the middle of a war, don't stand still. Or at least I think that would have been better in adding to the damages that Barry had also done, as well as showcase more consequence on what Professor Zoom had manipulated Barry to do, as an another example of the nice job breaking it hero trope. You'll have to take a number. And with that out of the way, now let's list out the other differences between the comic and the movie. Number one, the opening scene is done somewhat the same as in the comic, but it is a sunny day in it instead of raining while a young Barry and his mother are having car troubles next to the highway. Number two, Barry's mother has aged surprisingly well compared to the comic version, and even without the speed force, Barry recovers much faster after having fallen down stone stairs outside of the Central City Police Department. Number three, Barry seems to suffer from adaptional dumbassery in being unable to read the room with all the changes when his mother tells him that Justice League does not exist. Number 4. The Flashpoint Batman is using guns. That's right, the comic version of Thomas still fought with his bare hands and held on to a similar no-guns rule as his son did, even when he was still open to killing his opponents. That makes me believe that Tom King and Joshua Williamson never read the comic and only watched this movie for when they wrote the button in 2017 and reintroduced Thomas while using guns. Number 5. Cyborg is not shown leaving Jojo, as she is named in the movie now, to the police after he saves her and goes to try recruiting Thomas, meaning that he probably let her walk away free. Number 6. That holographic meeting is over a lot faster than in the comic, as all the characters attending it are named just before Thomas tells them Screw you guys, I'm going home. But Carmen, we're trying to- uh, Screw you guys, home. Number 7. After seeing Iris not only be married to another man and having a child with him, Barry doesn't even ask his mother if he can borrow her car and just takes it so he can go find Batman. Number 8. Okay, this is more of a criticism on the writing of the movie than a difference, because after realizing that the Flashpoint Batman is not Bruce Wayne but his father, Barry literally spells it out as if to tell it to the viewing audience, rather than having the scene end with the wham line from the end of the first issue. Bruce is dead. I watched him die. My god, he's the one who died that night in the alley. Bruce died, and you lived. You're his father. You're Thomas Wayne. 
Number 9. Pirate Death Rogue's death at the hands of Aquaman is shared with Lex Luthor also being present during the spectacle of an action set piece. Number 10. Steve Trevor is confirmed to die when caught by Wonder Woman and her Amazon in the ruins of Great Britain. Mr. I suck as a character Trevor. Number 11. Barry's memories only start to get rewritten after their first failed attempt to get him his speed back. And the differences to the mainstream DC universe are shown as if he was there to witness them, instead of just showing his point of view of them from a distance. Number 12. Thomas is established to be an alcoholic by drinking from a flask when they try to get Barry's powers back again, with him dropping it when he falls off the roof and Barry returning it to him when he saves Thomas with his speed. Number 13. The reverse flash saves Lois from being caught by the Amazon so she can make contact with the Resistance as a foreshadowing in letting himself be seen on her camera. Number 14. Barry tunes up Eobar Thorne's costume from yellow to red instead of making a new one, and then tries and fails to run back in time, as if he knew what to change in the past. Number 15. Abin Sur died in this version of the story, whereas in the comic he is alive and present as a Green Lantern during Cyborg's original holographic meeting. Number 16. Barry and Thomas meet up with Cyborg in Metropolis, where Baby Call El ship crash landed, instead of in Gotham. Number 17. Element Woman is sadly cut out of the movie by making Kal El deal with Project Superman's security team before he abandons Barry, Thomas, and Cyborg. Number 18. Thomas just tells Barry to fight his Caesars, rewriting his memories and not to forget Bruce, instead of giving him an epileptic Caesar shot of Phenytoin sodium. Number 19. And then he and Cyborg take Barry to the Sazam kids for no in-movie explained reason other than, I guess, the story moves the characters instead of the characters moving the story. Number 20. Instead of telling Barry, Either we change this world, or let it burn in hell. Thomas seems more open to leave and go respond to lootings happening in Gotham when the end of the world is nigh with Aquaman and Wonder Woman's war. Later, when they are flying to Britain, he then tells Barry he only agreed to stay on board because he managed to see Lois Lane's latest report, where Professor Zoom let himself be seen. Number 21. They get shot down by Aquaman's forces who have not even started to fight Wonder Woman's Amazons yet. Number 22. Enchantress is not in this movie either to betray them and turn Captain Thunder back into the Sasan kids. Wonder Woman forces him to do it with her lasso and then kills Billy. Number 23. I already went over everything with Barry and Reverse Flash's confrontation, so I'll just focus on the fact that this ending battle is greatly dramatized with character deaths, especially cyborgs who dies to his wounds when Kal El arrives lives too late to save him from Aquaman. Aquaman's side then loses when he can't fight against Wonder Woman anymore after Kal El cut his arm off, and Gorilla Grodd does not show up at any point. Number 24. Before dying, Aquaman sets off his WMD that Cyborg mentioned in the comic, which is revealed to be Captain Atom, who never became Captain Atom in the Flashpoint comic, and was as Captain Nathaniel Adams mentioned to be in charge of Project Superman. Number 25. Well, obviously, Thomas kills Eobard Thorne with a gun instead of a sword he probably picked up from a fallen Amazon. I think this was the same gun that Joe Schill had used to kill Bruce in this timeline, and Thomas kept in a case in his Batcave and took it out of it just so he could kill Professor Zoom with it. And it probably could have been a powerful moment if he was not using guns by default like in the comic. Number 26. This part where Barry is trying to run away from the shockwave from Aquaman's WMD works as a great visual reference to Crisis on Infinite Earths, where the Flash is shown trying to run away from a white wall of antimatter like this. Number 27. 
and the price of that last one is that the emotional goodbye Barry was shown having with his mother and so move on from her death are cut. Number 28. Some good news. Barry's and Iris's marriage seems to have been restored when he returns back to his own timeline. Number 29. Instead of ending the movie here, with Bruce thanking Barry for delivering him the letter from his father as an emotional send-off, we are given this CGI animation of the Flash running on the ropes of Gotham and then there is the quick post credit scene leading up to Justice League War. I could probably say something about the rest of the voice cast too, but this video, or the script I'm writing for it, is already so long and I still need to talk about the 2023 Flash movie. So before that, let me quickly tell you the other cardinal sin that the CW Flash show committed, other than just making Flashpoint happen in one episode before we move on to the movie. Now who's the villain, Flash? Now who's the villain? I am, and I'm doing a good job too. The first season adapted from the Flash Rebirth 2009 comic, how the reverse Flash traveled back in time to kill Barry's mother at the night when Barry was at home to see him as a child. As shown in the Flash Rebirth miniseries, the murder of Nora Allen happened during the day when Barry was at school and he came home to see his father being taken by the police in handcuffs. The TV showed us the same, but only after Barry had seen the vibrating blur of Eobard Thorn in their house, essentially giving him a cheat sheet to know his father was innocent instead of believing in his father's innocence. This feels away from what I see as one of the most powerful emotional scenes in Flash Rebirth, where Professor Zoom confesses to Barry in the climax of the fifth issue on how he has been every bad day in his life, and Barry draws the conclusion that the reverse Flash was the one who murdered his mother, which Thorne gleefully confirms. Do you remember the day you broke your arm in the sixth grade? Someone pushed you down the stairs in school. But when you looked up, no one was there. Do you remember the electrical fire that burned down your first house in Fallville? Or the day you moved to Central City and left the back door open? Your dog ran out and got hit by a car. What if every bad thing that happened to you was orchestrated by one person, by an enemy you hadn't even made yet? I opened the door, Barry. I started the fire. I pushed you down the stairs. You, you did it, didn't you? You son of a bitch. Yes. I murdered your mother, Barry. Not having known Professor Zoom was the murderer gave that scene so much depth and drama that it could have been practically gift wrap for the CW superhero drama show to adapt. Reverse Flash's motivations for coming to the past in the first place was then changed into him wanting to kill Barry as a child, which I explained in reading his dialogue from the comic to be out of the question for Thor to do without erasing himself from the timeline. Professor Zoom is from the future and needs the Flash to have existed up to his historically recorded death date so he could learn about the Flash in the first place and become the reverse Flash. Failing to kill Barry, thanks to an older Flash having followed Thor the past, and taking the younger Barry out of Professor Zoom's reach, the reverse Flash murders Nora Allen and frames her husband Henry for her murder. Henry Allen is shown to be alive in prison in the show, similar to the New 52 continuity, but he was essentially just used as fan service by being portrayed by John Wesley Shipps, the actor who played the Flash in the 1990s Flash TV show, before he was killed off by the Black Flash and recast as Jay Garrick. And then that one episode dedicated to the Flashpoint in the third season made Barry's reason and actions in causing it make him look worse than the animated version did in Justice League The Flashpoint Paradox, by having him willingly and knowingly go back in time to stop Thorn, change the past without Professor Zoom's manipulation, and imprisoned him inside a Faraday cage in the Flashpoint timeline. Knuckles, you've gone mad with power! 
Oh, really? Not into a police holding cell, but into a Faraday cage that negates Reverse Flash's connection to his negative speed force. And Barry is the only one who knows where he is held in. Would someone mad with power approve a law giving himself ultimate authority over everything? Even with Thorne's crimes of attempted murder, this is illegal! Selfish and unheroic, which the Flash should not be doing. That's the dictionary definition of mad with power! And it essentially makes Grant Gustin's portrayed version of Barry Allen look no better than Ezra Miller in real life. It's illegal! Okay, and now let's talk about the 2023 Flash movie. Use the hashtag you had one job to rain scorn down upon him. You f up and Sam. All right, it has been over a month since this movie came out, and it has already bombed at the box office and is on its way to the digital release. Meaning that there will obviously be spoilers. Number one. Barry's father is still alive in prison, unlike in the comic where he died in there. It was the New 52 comics that made him be alive again, and Zack Snyder's Justice League also acknowledged this, so... Eh. Number two. Since the ending twist of the comic is now over a decade old, the movie decided to do exactly what the CW Flash show did and make Barry aware of what he is doing when going back in time. He even talks with Bruce Wayne and Iris West about it before going through with it. Number 3. Since the movie does not bother to include or establish Professor Zoom's part or role in it, the movie goes out of its way to ignore who the murderer is altogether, and makes Barry instead focus on trying to change the circumstances of his mother's murder, by making it so that his father is at home with her. By the way, when the New 52 rewrote the events of Flash Rebirth to fit into the New 52 continuity, they made the Reverse Flash only kill Nora Allen and blackmail Henry Allen to take the blame or he would kill Barry as well. So by that implication, Barry's mother could still end up being murdered with his father going to prison for it, like in the original timeline. Number 4. Instead of waking up in a new timeline, Barry is pushed into it by the movie's version of the Black Flash, and ends up running into his younger self on the day he got his powers in 2013. And just like in the comic, Barry ends up losing his speed when trying to make sure that his younger self will get his powers. Number 5. Wonder Woman is completely MIA, and Aquaman was never born, so their war in Europe is replaced with a retelling of the third act of Man of Steel, with Michael Shannon back as General Zod, because this alternate timeline is set in 2013. Cyborg is also cut out of the movie because Ray Fisher refuses to work with Warner Bros. anymore. And instead of having Thomas Wayne as Batman, Warner Bros. decided to pull Michael Keaton back into the role for nostalgia bait. That clearly failed because the movie ended up bombing. And because Walter Hamada in leading the leftist Snyder cultist at Warner Bros. wanted to replace Ben Affleck's Batman with Michael Keaton. Number 6. Instead of having Project Superman under Metropolis, the two Barrys and Michael Keaton's Batman go to Russia, where instead of finding Subject 1 to be a timid and emaciated Carl L, we get an imprisoned Supergirl played by Sasha Kalle. By the way, looking at this selfish poster, Sasha Kalle's Supergirl could have also been Element Woman. Number 7. The main Barry getting his speed back is done somewhat the same, with a lightning strike powered electric chair that fails on the first try and then somehow works again when Supergirl flies him into the middle of a storm. And that somehow works. Number 8. The two Barrys, Supergirl and Michael Keaton's Batman go to join the US military, which does not include General Hardy or Swanwick present in it. And while in the comic this ended up being a war where no one wins, the movie decides to make this be a war where General Zod and the Sword of Rao are destined to win, meaning that Supergirl and Michael Keaton's Batman end up both dying twice. 
Michael Keaton's Batman first goes down in attempting a kamikaze landing against General Zal's ship, and then he perishes to his wounds from having barely won against a very nerfed version of Nam Ek, while Supergirl always dies fighting against General Zod. They end up dying twice, because the Barrys try to rewind time like Barry did in Zack Snyder's Justice League, but this movie decides to play with Doctor Who rules on fixed points in time, or, for a more recent example, canon events from across the Spider-Verse, meaning that they are destined to lose, and Sword of Rao is meant to win. Number 9. The confrontation with Eobar Thorne from the source material is substituted for the two Barrys ending up in an argument over letting the fixed point slash canon event happen, and the younger Barry in trying to keep fixing it then ends up turning into the Black Flash from all of his failed attempts. And the Black Flash then ends up getting defeated when the younger Barry sacrifices himself to keep the Black Flash from killing the main Barry, which then negates the Black Flash's existence. Knuckles, what do you have to say about it? See? Number 10. Barry does not stop his past self from changing the circumstances of how his mother died, but rather puts everything back mostly the way it was originally. The movie also does what it can to recreate the goodbye Barry had with his mother from the comic, by instead having him approach her as a stranger going through something, and without knowing who he is, Nora Allen's motherly instincts probably kick in sensing Barry as her son without being able to acknowledge him. It is a weird scene recreation, but credit where credit is due. Also, Barry ends up leaving one small change into the past that will in the present time cause his father to get an alibi for Nora Allen's murder and be exonerated. Number 11. And as if that extended running sequence at the end of the animated movie wasn't enough padding, the ending of this movie ended up getting rewritten and reshot, as far as I know, two or three times. In the first ending, Barry was supposed to be reunited with Sasha Gale's Supergirl and Michael Keaton's Bruce Wayne, whom Walter Hamada wanted to replace Henry Cavill's Superman and Ben Affleck's Batman with in going forward. Then there was an another ending filmed when Warner Media and Discovery Inc. merger happened, and Dwayne Johnson was trying to make Black Adam be a thing. A new ending would have had Henry Cavill's Superman also be there to meet his cousin Supergirl, along with Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. But then the Black Adam movie ended up underperforming, and Henry Cavill was let go after James Gunn and Peter Safran were put in charge of DC Studios. Supposedly, it was James Gunn's idea to film a whole new ending that cut out all of those characters, and they were replaced with a joke cameo from George. George Clooney, and that ending was filmed in January before James Gunn announced his slate of upcoming movies, while also saying that the Flash movie would work as a reset to the live-action movie universe. The Flash, a fantastic movie that I really love, that resets the entire DC universe. Does a joke cameo like that sound like a reset ending to you, Knuckles? No. Exactly. If I had been in James Gunn's position and made promises like that, I would have instead brought all the Justice League actors I was able to get for a final reunion scene at that ending, and then zoomed out of it to the multiverse that this movie established. Then I would have zoomed into a different Earth in the multiverse with a Blue Beetle cameo, because that movie is co was coming out next after this one. That would have been an actual reset, perkele! But now that I have gone over an hour talking about this comic and the three adaptations it got, I'll try to end this video with a quick final summary. Knowing that the original comic was turned into a reboot tool as a last second decision by Dan Dio makes it feel like a harbinger of things to come. The animated movie and the CW barely bothered to change anything with them, with the former barely having anything to change, and the CW lacking imagination, but the Flash movie itself ended up becoming an example of history repeating itself, and using what was originally its own standalone story as an ulterior motive tool. 
more or less, those adaptations have very much distilled and made the legacy of Flashpoint become disliked. Because whatever growth the character of Barry Allen was supposed to get from it is ignored in favor of focusing on the fact that it ended with the New 52 reboot. The Flash's reputation has also ended up suffering since the Flashpoint's follow-up stories came out, with none of these adaptations helping at all to make it better. The animated movie cut out Barry's legitimate reasons and motivations for making Flashpoint happen, the CW made Barry directly responsible for making Flashpoint happen, and the 2023 movie ended up prematurely aging poorly because of Ezra Miller's antics also not helping history repeat itself. This is why even before that movie came out, I was mentally already checked out of all the hype in it, and was more interested in waiting for the third Sonic the Hedgehog movie to come out instead. My god, Project Shadow. While I wait for that movie to come out at the end of next year, I'll probably keep doing more of these comic to adaptation comparison reviews while limiting my video game reviews unless those start to get more attention. Until my next video, which will probably be near Replicant Part 4 comes out, remember to like this video, comment your thoughts on it down below, share it for more people to see and subscribe to my channel. Also ding the bell for when I will be doing gameplay streams for a chance to chat with me while I play God of War Ragnarok at the time of writing, and May your heart be your guiding key.